Introducing the new book by Bob Tisdale, Climate Models Fail. The climate models prepared for the fifth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change show no skill at simulating surface temperatures, precipitation, or sea ice area. We live on the land surfaces of our planet called Earth. But we've all heard that the oceans, seas, and lakes cover about 70% of it. Not too surprisingly, the surface temperatures of the oceans and coupled ocean atmosphere processes dictate the vast majority of climate, now that's temperature and precipitation, here on Earth. And this takes place on annual, decadal, and multi-decadal time frames. Therefore, the surface temperatures of the oceans are very important in discussions of global warming or the lack thereof. An unheralded global warming milestone was reached in 1994. The sea surface temperatures of the largest ocean on Earth stopped warming. That's right, the surface temperatures of the Pacific Ocean stopped warming in 1994, nearly two decades ago. Sea surface temperatures there have varied in responses to El Nino and La Nina events, there's no doubt about that. But the linear trend of the satellite enhanced data indicates that the surface of the Pacific Ocean has not warmed in two decades. Now that's quite a blunder for the climate modelers who support the IPCC. The Pacific Ocean covers more of the surface of the Earth than all of the continental land masses combined. And the models used by the IPCC indicate the surface of the Pacific should have warmed in that time, assuming it was warmed by man-made greenhouse gases. In the years since 1994, the IPCC published its second, third, and fourth assessment reports, and the IPCC is publishing its fifth assessment report now in 2013. And in that time, with all of those IPCC reports, the surface of the largest body of water on Earth has not warmed. That's really quite remarkable when you think about it. Lucky thing for the IPCC, there are other ocean basins. The major body of water that had done its best, now that's past tense, had done its best to help keep the IPCC's human-induced global warming hypothesis alive was the Atlantic Ocean, primarily the North Atlantic. For the last 30 years or so, it has warmed at a much higher rate than the global oceans. There's really nothing surprising about that. The North Atlantic has an additional well-known mode of natural variability called the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation. But even the surface temperatures of the North Atlantic are conspiring against the IPCC. They stopped warming about a decade ago. One would have thought that the learned computer programming climate experts being used by the IPCC would have been able to see that coming. Let's see, the Pacific sea surface temperatures stopped warming two decades ago, and all of that additional warming that had been taking place in the sea surface temperatures of the North Atlantic has also stopped. As a result, we've entered what climate scientists are calling a global warming hiatus period, the pause. There are a couple of other names. Personally, I like stoppage because it sounds like Mother Nature went on strike against the IPCC. But no matter what term you use, the surface temperatures of our planet stopped warming globally even though the emissions of man-made greenhouse gases have been increasing exponentially and have reached a new threshold. For confirmation, the three primary suppliers of global surface temperature data show that the warming of global land plus sea surface temperatures has slowed considerably 
since 1998 and has stopped since 2001. Climate models can't explain it. Just this year, there are scientific papers confirming that the models being used by the IPCC for their fifth assessment report cannot explain the stoppage in global warming. For some people, that comes as no surprise, no surprise at all. Climate model outputs and observation-based data are both available online to the public. Independent researchers who are skeptical of human-induced global warming, like me, have been comparing climate model outputs to observation-based data for years. We've illustrated that climate models show no skill at being able to simulate land surface air temperatures around the globe. They can't model sea surface temperatures in any way, shape, or form globally or for the individual ocean basins. They do not properly simulate combined land plus sea surface temperatures since 1880. They can't model precipitation globally or regionally. And they definitely miss the boat when it comes to simulating sea ice area in the Arctic and in the southern ocean surrounding Antarctica. There are numerous scientific studies that are very critical of climate model performance. But very few people outside of the climate science community are aware of those papers or understand the implications of those model failings. Those research papers present the flaws that climate models exhibit in their failed attempts to simulate a number of variables or processes. These include the basic processes associated with El Nino and La Nina events, the atmospheric responses to volcanic eruptions, and as we've noted before, climate models can't simulate precipitation both globally and regionally, can't simulate cloud cover, can't simulate sea ice extent, and they can't simulate the influence of El Nino events on hurricanes or the decadal and multi-decadal variations in sea surface temperatures. As a result of the last, the models do not simulate the long-term variations in land surface temperature and precipitation caused by those long-term variations in sea surface temperatures. Those papers are discussed in my new book, Climate Models Fail. And for persons without technical backgrounds, the terms used by the scientists are defined in simple terms or a non-technical translation is provided. The book Climate Models Fail also presents other model failings like their inability to simulate polar amplification. During warming periods, the models cannot simulate the degree to which polar amplification causes the Arctic to warm. Polar amplification also exaggerates the Arctic cooling during cooling periods, and that's definitely something the models cannot simulate. Climate models do a very poor job with daily maximum and minimum temperatures, and the difference between the two, which is known as the diurnal temperature range. And with more than 260 color-coded graphs and maps, the book Climate Models Fail confirms that the models being used by the IPCC for their fifth assessment report show no skill at simulating the metrics we've already discussed a few times. Land surface temperatures, sea surface temperatures, the data sets that present the combined land plus sea surface temperatures, precipitation, and hemispheric sea ice area. Climate models fail also goes into great detail to explain why it is extremely important for climate models to be able to simulate El Nino and La Nina events and their processes. This is an ability they lack after decades of modeling efforts. Without the ability to simulate El Nino and La Nina processes, climate models cannot properly perform attribution studies or project future climate. Because the hiatus period, the pause, the stop in global warming, 
interests people, climate models fail also presents model data temperature comparisons starting in 2001. Now, by this point in the book, the models have already been shown to be fatally flawed. So these sections are just for informational purposes. But they allow readers to see which ocean basins and which regional land areas are still warming or are cooling or have remained about the same since 2001. And it's also obvious which ocean basins have caused global temperatures to plateau. Climate Models Fail is available now in Kindle format through Amazon and in PDF format through my website, Climate Observations. Y'all have a nice day.